unique publication party was held in the presence of young poets, writers, magicians, and other masters of the arts. Among them was Jake Levin, an American poet who has been translating contemporary Korean poems into English to be communicated abroad. After taking notice of the boundless potential of Korean poetry, Levin has been searching for promising contemporary poets to help them reach a broader audience across the world. Korea has a lot of potential because at the moment there are very few contemporary poets that have been translated and suddenly there's such a big demand for Korean literature abroad because of the vegetarian and because of poets like Kim Hye-seong. And so I think it's a very exciting time for Korean poetry, at least Korean poetry in translation. The American poet reinterprets the works by Korean poets with linguistic sensitivity. On today's The Interview, meet Jake Levin, a young poet from America, who is helping to propagate Korean poetry with tremendous passion. And welcome to the interview. I'm your host, Su Jung. When Korean novelist Han Gang was awarded the Man Booker International Prize for Fiction recently, it brought to light the importance of translators as mediators. It also brought hope to introduce Korean literature, in particular poetry, to a wider global audience. And our guest today is doing his part. Let's meet Jake Levine, an American poet who is translating Korean poems for English-speaking readers. Jake, welcome to the interview. Thank you so much for joining us today. Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure to have you. Um, being a songwriter, I'm really, really interested in you know, the creativity and the imagery used in the language of poetry. So really, really excited for today's talk. So we'll be talking about Korean poetry specifically. Um, for myself, having grown up in England, I find Korean poetry kind of hard to approach. It seems a little bit complex, a little bit obscure, um, and it must be even more so for people who don't have a full grasp of the language. So how did you come to be interested in Korean literature and in particular Korean contemporary poetry? Well, I think, you know, first of all, uh, I'm a poet, and so I've lived in a number of countries, and no matter where I go, even if it's on vacation, I take a general interest mm -hmm. in the literature. I think uh, poetry and um, literature can offer us a vantage point to see a society in a different way that popular media can't. And poets generally talk about certain subjects which perhaps may be taboo in a culture. Mm. And so I think it gives you a way to see a culture in the world from a vantage point mm -hmm. that you don't often get in any other media. So why Korea then? The reason I first came to this country is I got a job here. Right. Uh, For practical reasons. Oh yeah, yeah. And then uh, before I came to Korea, the most well-known contemporary poet that's been translated in America is Kim Hae Soon, mm -hmm. translated by Choi Don Mi, um, and she. At the time when I left America in 2010, originally I left to go to Lithuania, um, Kim Hae Soon became super popular when I was mm. in graduate school. And so I'm like, wow, Kim Hae Soon is really fantastic. There's got to be probably a wealth of contemporary Korean poetry that right. either hasn't been translated mm. or is just not available to an English speaking audience yet. Um, and that turned out to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, that's right. why. Yeah. So you became interested in that kind of niche market. Right. Um, and I hear Korean poetry is being brought into the limelight within American and European publishing industries. How, how did that happen and well, I how's think, it going? I think maybe the quality of translation is really high because there's a new wave of translators. But mm -hmm. I think the new wave of translators also understand that translation is not just a task that's like you take a text and then you you know put it in English and then you're right. done. Mm -hmm. I think they really know how to market 
and how the business of publishing works. And so I think the success of somebody like Deborah Smith or Choi Don Mi is that they're already integrated and invested within the publishing industry. Mm. And so I think there were quality and there are quality translations of Korean literature, but I think the, the new wave of translators, the younger translators, know that you have to kind of like work within the system. Right. And you have to not only translate a text, but you have to publicize mm. and you have to get work published in magazines and things mm -hmm. like that. So get the word out. Right. And you yourself have made a huge contribution to the promotion of Korean poetry. And I think the international you know, literary circles are definitely taking notice. And in particular, you gave a presentation on Korean poetry at a conference held by the Association of Writers and Writing Programs earlier this year. What was your presentation about? Uh, we hmm. went to AWP uh, with the poet Kim Yi-dum and Kim Kyung-ju. And yeah. AWP is the largest gathering of authors and presses in North America, and they hold it once a year. The presentation itself was part of the conference, and it was about the translation of Korean poetry. But really, what it was about is, at the moment, it's really great that there's a lot of attention being paid to um, Korean literature. But I think all translators need to think about also uh, the social element of where translation operates within a society. Mm. And so like translation, I think, is neither, when you translate a text from Korean to English, that text becomes foreign in English. And so it kind of occupies a status where it's not Korean literature anymore because right. it's, it's, it was written in Korean, mm. but it's not English literature either. And so you're representing not only a poet and his work, or a novelist and their work, but you're also representing an entire culture. Mm. And so we need to think about the relationship between like the political or the social relationship between America and Korea, but right. also the historical aspect of how the two cultures have been interlinked. Right, and so was it quite well received, your presentation? How did people respond? Uh, I think it was well received. I think in a general sense, bringing Kim Yi-dum and Kim Kyung-ju um, and being able to have a discussion that wasn't dominated by just like a white face who was a translator, but also having the authors present mm. to discuss what it means for them to have their work right. translated right. and to be kind of like, I mean, right now, there are not very many young writers whose work has been translated. Mm. And so I think it was really well received. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you mentioned Kim Kyung-ju. Um, you've translated quite a few of his uh, works, and you went on a poetry reading tour with him recently. How was that? Uh, it was really great. Uh, we went for two and a half weeks. We were together. Wow. We Around were, Korea? No, we were in America. Oh, I we see. We went on a reading tour in America. Oh, and so we flew to America and started at the University of Houston in Houston, Texas, and we ended up in Phoenix, Arizona. And so like each city, each day we were in a new city, meeting new people, mm. staying either at a hotel or like a poet's house. Mm -hmm. And so it was a really exciting time. Uh, for him, I think it was really a strange way to be introduced to, he's never been to, he went to New York one time, right. but he never really got to know America. Mm. And if you go, if you drive through a place like Texas and you go to like the middle of nowhere in Texas, like yeah. that's real, America. Indeed. Oh, yeah, so it was really, it was, yeah, it was really great. Wow, so he got an experience of the true America oh, yeah, yeah, with yeah. you. Wow, okay, well, let's have a look at one of Kim jong jus works. So this is the latest works that you translated yeah. of Kim jong jus It's called Nabi Jam, or Butterfly Sleep. Very interesting title. Um, and I had a rifle through before the interview, and it has a very interesting format as well. It seems to be like a mixture of a play and poetry. Um, and I hear it took you quite a while to translate as well. What, what made you decide to want to do it? What was particularly appealing about this book? It's coming out in December in New York. It's being produced at uh, Playhouse in New York. Okay. Um, with another play that I'm currently translating. Mm. Uh, called Nukde Nunal Buto Jaranda, mm -hmm. Bread from the Eyes of a Wolf. And so together, they're gonna to be produced in New York. I think Kim Kyung-ju, if you talk about Kim Kyung-ju in terms of Korean contemporary poetry, I think he's 
exceptional in many ways, but I think he's super important in that the way that his imagination works or the way that he uses language is unlike, not only Korean poets, but in the world, unlike any poet I've ever read. In, in my, what way? He incorporates surrealism in a way in his work which is completely unfamiliar to me. So to translate him is always a joy mm. because as I'm translating, I'm like, I've never read I've never read an image like this. The way that he creates affect in his poems by moving through images mm -hmm. creates a kind of feeling or a kind of feeling that comes from a place that I'm unfamiliar with. Right. And so like I think a lot of people when they when they talk about Kim Kyung Ju's poetry, they're like, it's really difficult, it's really complex. But his first book, this, this book, Nan in Ise Song E Omnin Ke Choida, I Am a Season That Doesn't Exist in the World. Mm -hmm. I mean, this book has sold like 27,000 27, copies in Korea. And so that's an insane amount Indeed. of copies for a poetry book to sell. And so even though it's really difficult um, and it challenges tradition, and is something that people aren't accustomed to read, mm. it enjoys a popularity and people are really moved by the poems. Mm. And I think that's really, if it's really difficult, but it's also really popular, I mean, you've touched on something that's really like a part of greatness. Right. Yeah. And I can tell from you talking about it that you, you know, you have a passion for his work. You really believe in it. Oh yeah, no. Yeah. I mean, he, I think this, his poetry and his plays are, they're incredible. I think mm. the world. I think the world will benefit from having them become available in right. different languages. And you're helping yeah. to do that around the world. Um, and I know you've developed close relationships with other Korean poets as well. So we've prepared a short video on Korean poetry and the people behind them. Let's take a look. This is the place Jake Levin meets frequently with his fellow poets. Korean poets appreciate his work in propagating Korean poetry and the respect is mutual. Jake Levin is born in the Philippines as a poet. He has worked as a poet as a poet and has a very sharp time to see the poet. That's why we have a very important language of Korean culture in Korean culture. Poetry Slam is where poets come together to recite original works. On lonely days, I touch my skin. The music roams the empire of my inner body, and yet I wonder whether it lives. Jake Levin especially admires Kim kyung -ju's poems. Levin has translated Kim's I Am a Season That Does Not Exist in the World and his most recent poetry book, Butterfly Sleep, to be distributed worldwide. <laughs> Several months ago, the duo went on a poetry reading tour across the United States of America and received rave reviews. 차를 한대 렌트를 해서 책을 잔뜩 싣고 그 미국 텍사스에서 출발해서 애리조나, 피닉스, 아스틴, 달라스 뭐한 일곱 여덟 개 도시를 매일 매일 달리면서 그곳에 내려서 대학 로비에서 때로는 갤러리에서 뭐 이런 식으로 거의 뭐 전형화된 어떤 공간에서 하지 않고. 그런 낭독기를 한 3,500 마일 정도를 달리다 봤죠. 근데 미국의 현지에서 받는 독이 좋았었고 개인적으로도 아주 독특한 유행이었던 것 같아요. Levin thinks Korean female poets' works have a unique allure and imaginable descriptions to the international community. He has helped Kim Idem, whose works are described as serial and experimental. 여성의 어떤 심리나 결이라든지 문장을 잘 읽어내는 그런 특별한 능력이 있어요. 단어 하나를 가지고 고민을 해서 충분히 발효하고 충분히 검색해 가지고 그것을 문장으로 가지고 오니까 다른 번역자들하고는 차이가 있는 거죠 아무래도. 
Now you said in the past that female Korean poets have this unique imagination and beauty and you've taken a particular interest in their works. Why is that? I think women in particular in Korea are really important because they challenge ideas of what a woman should be mm. in this society. But for a foreign audience in America, they challenge stereotypes that maybe Western readers have of Asian women. Right. As like the docile mm. woman who like is always secondary to man, this kind of confusion, yeah. patriarchal system. And I think contemporary women in contemporary women poets in Korea particularly have addressed that issue in a way that is really surprising to foreign readers. Mm. Um, and so I think their work has a certain power with American, American readership for sure. Sometimes when you translate a text, it can contain a new kind of meaning in a foreign culture mm. that maybe gains weight or gains gravitas. Right. And so like Hong Gong winning the Man Booker mm -hmm. or like Oma Butake, uh, Please Look After Mom, enjoying the success that it had. Right. Um, because they address issues of, of what it means to be a woman in mm -hmm. Korea. And that's resonated with a foreign audience in a way that's maybe unexpected. And do you think it will have a big effect on Korean society itself? If something gains notoriety abroad, like Kim Hae-soon, if Kim Hae-soon gains a lot of notoriety abroad, mm. then that will only amplify the interest in her work in Korea. Right. And if more people read more books by Kim Hae-soon or more books by Kim Min-jong, uh, then I think the society, uh, it'll have an impact on society. Mm. I think it can't have a negative impact. It'll be probably positive. Okay. You've yeah. mentioned Kim Hae-soon a couple of times now. Yeah. Um, is she one of the female Korean poets that most inspire you? Is there anyone else? Yeah, even though like there are a lot of poets like Goa and uh, who have, been, have lots of books translated mm. into English. I don't think amongst contemporary poets, a poet has had the kind of effect that Kim Hae Soon has had among American readership. Mm. Like we didn't, we couldn't imagine, just like Hollywood allowed us to imagine Korea as a country. Now everybody, like before Gangnam Style, probably everybody thought Korea in their head and they couldn't think of like a name or a place. So they thought mm. Seoul and they couldn't see it. And then they saw Gangnam Style and saw things, or mm. Namsong Tower or whatever. And so now in their imagination, this is like the effect that Kim Hae Soon has had on poets. And so I think when people think of the most representative Korean poet in America, people think Kim Hae Soon, mm -hmm. yeah. Let's talk about your Korean abilities, which are pretty amazing, because I know you've been here four years right. you told me before the show. I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult language to grasp, especially if you haven't grown up speaking it. Oh, yeah. um, and to get to a level where you're able to translate Korean poems, that's absolutely amazing. So how did you, how did you end up learning Korean? How long did it take you to get to that level? I studied for a year in Gwangju mm -hmm. at Cheonam University. Um, and when I first got here, I didn't speak any Korean. Uh, right. I couldn't even read Hangul. Uh, and so um, I met Kim Kyungju really like maybe the third week I was in Korea. Oh, wow. And so I said to him, I'll try and translate your poems. And he said, OK. Uh, and so I realized I didn't, you know, like if you pick up a dictionary, you can't really. It's like impossible. Mm. And so I just kept learning. I started to go to a, a Korean language school. I went to Yonsei's Korean language school and then I um, got a scholarship to do my PhD here. Okay, and you mentioned you were in Gwangju and you ended up uh, learning about the <laughs> regional dialects and oh, yeah. the regional literature as well. Oh yeah. Uh, was there, I mean, was that just because of the environment you were in? Did you take a particular interest in it? Yeah, I mean, I was in Gwangju for a year and I learned, you know, like, Jola, Jola do Saturi, mm -hmm. like, Can you give us a little? Hobolage <laughs> Jimmy Soyo. Hobolage. Which means, yeah, it means like a lot, a lot of, like, a modifier. Okay, okay. Uh, but my, probably my Saturi is not very good. But, you know, like, if you live in Jola, when I first lived in Jola do, I couldn't understand what people were saying to me mm. because the Saturi is really sick. <laughs> right. Uh, and that's maybe one of the, I know a lot of different translators have talked about like the difficulty of translating Saturi, um, but it's like the color 
of the language.、Mm. Korea has like many colors to the language, and so there are many Koreans. There's not just like one language. There are many different kinds of Koreans, and so it was interesting to be in a place where people express themselves in the same language、mm. but very differently. Right. And so it it made the depth of my understanding and my appreciation of the language greater. Right. To have lived there.、Yeah. I mean. I've read translated novels before. I have to say, I haven't read much translated poetry, but I feel like it, it must be on a different level, a completely different challenge from translating novels,、um, because you can't just translate word for word. Obviously, you have the structure to think about as well. You have to convey the original meaning, but at the same time, keep the flow of poetry going too. So, how how difficult is it to find that right balance? Super difficult. <laughs> <laughs>、uh... You know, like when we talk about translating poetry, for poetry, there's there's multiple things that are really important. One of the things that's that's most important is,、uh, like I was discussing earlier, is that poetry, it changes the way that people think about language.、Mm. And people have always said, like the thing that differentiates humans and animals is that humans have an ability to speak to one another, communicate、mm. at a more advanced level. Yeah. Um, and we take that for granted. What poets do is they revivify the quality of language by using it in a particular way. And so I think when you translate poetry, you can't keep a lot of the things that a poet does in their original language.、Mm. So, like, if a word has multiple meanings, or somebody plays with that meaning or language in one language, it's almost impossible to translate that. Indeed. But it's important to I. Identify the things that they do as a habit, or the rules that they are breaking,、mm. or how they create affect in a poet poem, so that you can translate that quality and depth of their work. Like even bong and bread, because bread is something that is so like integral to in, you know English English speaking cultures.、Mm. It's, it's like our our bop our sal,、mm-hmm. and so like sal and bop and bread and rice. That when you translate those words,、right. they don't have the same connotation or etymology or place within culture and society,、mm. and so like it's literally impossible. The I think the the process of translating between two languages is literally impossible. But what you can translate is intention,、mm. depth,、uh, nuance, and hopefully do it artfully、yeah. or skillfully. Sounds like a very, very difficult job, <laughs> indeed.、Yeah. And does being a poet help in your translations? I mean, it must help, you know, to better understand and appreciate poems. Does it help with your translations too? First, like a poet is somebody who's interested, who just studies poetry.、Mm. I mean, I, I don't write as much as I read. And to be a student of poetry for the last sixteen years of my life, I mean, has helped me understand. How poetry functions,、um, but also has helped me understand like ideas about what it means to be human. And so, like, there's a there's a poet Ed Hirsch who says that poetry, what poetry offers us, is that when people feel things, it increases the depth of our capacity to feel. So you can feel a deeper happiness if you're happy,、mm. but you can also feel. A deeper quality of sadness, and so what poetry reminds us of is that human emotions have a depth to them, and I think to experience those depths, or to understand those depths, is a gift that poetry offers us in,、mm. in any language.、Yeah. Okay, and you spent some time in Lithuania. As well,、um, and you've translated Lithuanian poetry.、Yeah. How did that come about? I mean, you seem very interested in different cultures and、uh, their literature. Why is that? I went there initially to do research、uh, about my fam- my family. I'm Jewish, right? And so I did research about my family, where they're from, which is like the middle of the countryside in Lithuania, in a place called Shadava,、um, and. Kind of wrestle with the idea of my identity as a Jewish person, as an American Jew,、mm. um, because to go to Lithuania, there are not there are not very many Jews left, obviously because of the Holocaust, and so that's initially why I went there. But then I met, you know, like being a poet. Of course, anywhere you go, 
like the there's a joke that like if you're a poet you always have a couch to sleep on no matter right. where you go in the world and so mm. I met a younger poet his name was uh, his name is Thomas Slombus and he wrote a book called God Thing and he said can you help me translate my book into English um, he's a performance conceptual poet and so not only okay. was it a book of poetry but it was also like a music performance right and so like I not only got to see uh, you know, the book after it got published, but mm -hmm. I also got to see him like do the translations. He did it in Lithuanian and also in English, ah. uh, which was pretty wild. <laughs> uh, and so it was great. I mean, it was a really great experience. Well, we're going to watch another video now. Let's watch Jake in action. This is Jake Levin's home where his creativity comes to life. He is currently translating the poems by Kim min -jang. He examines and re-examines the poem in an attempt to fully grasp the mood, form and subtle nuance and to be inspired by every word, but it's never quite that easy. The difficulty of translating Kim min -jang is she uses uh, her playfulness with language. She uses a lot of the same words like words with dual meanings and plays with the meaning or plays with the sound. And those are things that we can't translate from Korean into English. Captivated by Korean poetry, he came to love the language and his fondness for the language has only been growing ever since he laid eyes on first Korean poem. Because motion is moving people. And so like, how do you move people with language? How do you make them feel things in language? And so if you don't understand how that works in the first place, I think it's really difficult to translate poetry. He met with a poet to fully comprehend her poems. Putting chit chats and friendly bantons aside, these two close friends immediately got down to business and had a serious talk about the translation work. 그러니까 여기서의 데칼코마니는 삶과 죽음이야. 우리들이 늘 살아 있는 것처럼 보이지만 우리의 반은 죽음이잖아. 아. 그래서 그런 의미로 데칼코마니라는 단어를 쓴 거야. 우리 한국에서는 뭐 저가 쓰는 언어, 제가 쓰는 언어들은 보통 여성들이 잘안 쓰는 언어들을 써 왔거든요. 한국에서는 그걸 되게 불편하게 여겼다면 영어로 번역했을 때 그건 되게 또 어떤 신선한 맛이 좀 있는 모양인 것 같더라고요. 그러니까 움직임이 좋잖아요. 생각보다는 되게 쉽지 않은 작업인데 꼼꼼하게 하고 있다는 느낌을 일단 받았고. It's very interesting to watch how you worked. Uh, and as I understand it, you're a university professor uh, teaching translation as well. How is that? When students come to translation classes or come to poetry classes, I mean, a lot of students haven't been exposed to that much poetry mm. and so I think it's something it's really new for them and so maybe more than like teaching them how to translate things well it's really teaching them how to read a poem right okay and so um, because maybe they learned about poetry in high school or maybe they taught like, like took a class when they started college and so really like being able to teach like you know why I love poetry mm. is really great. Um, but it's also really great to have students like try something they've never done before. Right. And so and something that they're really uncomfortable with. Mm. Um, and so I think it's been really super rewarding for me. It's always great to, to constantly have uh, people who are interested and enthusiastic about what you're doing. Mm. Because if you know you just translate, it's kind of lonely, right? right. And so like if you just translate and you're like, you translate for like six months and you're, you're not going to class, you're not teaching students, you're not talking about literature, it can feel very lonely. Like you don't have a community mm -hmm. or you don't have people. So it's really great to like once or twice a week go and talk about, you know, what you're doing, why you love something. Right. Yeah, it renews your energy. Right. It's interesting that you kind of just immerse them in the world of poetry rather than teach a step-by-step -step guide on how to translate. And I'm sure that results in them, you know, growing their actual appreciation for poetry rather than thinking of it as just a job to do. 
Right. Nice. Um, and you're bridging Korea and America through contemporary poetry. Uh, we've mentioned it a couple of times. As well as your translation of Korean poetry, though, you're also trying to introduce American poets to Korea. What have you done in that aspect? I've been doing uh, syndicated articles for the webzine, Moonjong, for the last two years, where we introduce American poets, contemporary American poets. Uh, so I write like an introduction to their work. Mm -hmm. I do an interview with them, and we also translate their poems into Korean. Okay. I also do like when I've somehow become like this this kind of like if a Kore if an American poet comes to Korea, even like not on business, mm -hmm. just like on vacation or something, like I meet them. But somehow I've become like this liaison between American poets who come here for whatever reason and Korean poets who are interested in meeting younger American poets. Right. And so like even like this poet Christy Maxwell was here for just like one night and we went out with Kim Kyung Ju mm. and Kim Min Jong. Or like last semester, um, Richard Greenfield, who's a poet uh, who teaches at New Mexico State University, he was here for six months on a Fulbright, mm -hmm. and we organized an event at Yonsei wow. and did a poetry reading and translated his poems into Korean. Mm -hmm. So it was a bilingual reading. Right. So who, which of these American poets have had a really good response from Koreans? Well, I think Richard, when Richard was here, we did a reading. It was, I read with Richard and Kim kyung Joo, and we read together at Yonsei, mm -hmm. and there was like 120 students that wow. came to the reading, which is really, it was really amazing. Um, and so I think... I think it's been, he had a great time here, and I think his time here was really enriched by the fact that he was linked to so many poets that he got to meet. Mm -hmm. And I think the language barrier, like when a poet or a publisher, like Joyelle McSweeney from Action Books was here also last year, and when she came, she came through LTI Korea, invited her as a publisher, and so she had events and she had a translator, but to go out with another poet mm -hmm. who can kind of like, liaise between Korean poets and American poets, like naturally, instead of having a translator, a right. professional translator, right. is much more like a natural thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like, uh, yeah, that's kind of like what I do now, I guess, is liaise. <laughs> liaise. Yeah. Liaise and translator. Yeah. I see. Um, and there are so many excellent literary works in Korean literature and poetry. Um, and you're obviously doing your part to bring that to a global audience. But is there anything do you think that needs to change in order to make Korean literature and in particular poetry even more accessible? So I think right now, I think the Korean government has done a good job of supporting organizations like the, the Literature Translation Institute. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, you, we can't underestimate the job they've done. I mean, without them, I don't think any of the trans any of us translators would be working or have as many books published and so i think they really do an outstanding job mm -hmm. um i think that funding and support needs to continue like i think the award that i mean the man booker prize is obviously a huge deal and deborah does a really great job with promoting her work in korean literature abroad she's a really great advocate for Korean literature, or Kelly Falconer, who runs a literary agency. Um, and so I think right now, things are changing in a way where people are paying more attention to contemporary Korean literature mm -hmm. abroad. Can we do any more? I mean, I think we just have to keep, we have to keep publishing work and translating work that's really incredible and believing mm -hmm. in it and supporting it. Um, and I think eventually, like, I mean, it's already becoming way more popular and mm. people are taking more notice. I'm very interested to see which direction it will go. And you've said in the past in an interview that the first Korean writer to win the Nobel Prize in literature would be someone who wrote about issues about women. What did you mean by that? Could you elaborate for us? Because if you look at like the books that people are paying attention to abroad, they're by female writers about female issues. Um, which have strong feminist slants. And so I think it would be really, it would be a, a wise decision, mm -hmm. like a strategic decision right. to uh, nominate a woman. But I think it would also, I mean, 
our, our, a question you asked a little while ago is like, um, you know, can literature and translation change society? If a woman writer who writes about feminist issues in Korea wins the Nobel Prize, mm. that, that will change society, like def definitely. Do you think we're anywhere near that point? I mean, the work is there. Mm. People, there's kind of this like, <laughs> in Korea, there's this atmosphere of like, oh, we haven't won the Nobel Prize, so our literature, why? Like, is it just not good enough? That's not true. Mm. I mean, there, there are great writers of course. and great work that has been written and is being written right now. And I think those kind of prizes, the Man Booker and the Nobel Prize, these big you know, international prizes, those prizes are judged not only by the merit of the work, but also they're very political. Mm. And so like, I mean, also talking about a previous question you asked, like now is a really great opportunity because there's so much attention being paid to Korean literature after mm. winning this prize. And so it would be really great to nominate someone who I think has a great chance of winning. And I think that Indeed. that person is probably a female writer talking about female issues. Okay. Yeah. Well, we've talked about a lot of things today and I'm sure you've inspired a lot of our viewers today. So could you give any words of advice to them or to anyone who's you know, walking down the same particular path as you are? If you love art and you want to be an artist of any kind, translator, translators are also artists. Um, if you want to be an artist of any kind, I think you should really love literature, but you should also, I mean, in society, when you become an artist, a lot of people are like, oh, that job is maybe not important or it doesn't get paid money. Mm -hmm. Or your parents will be like, you'll never make any money, become a doctor. But I think art plays a role in society that is just as profoundly important as any other job. Mm. And so I think if you want to be an artist, you should take art incredibly seriously mm -hmm. and understand also the weight of what art means to culture and mm -hmm. people. And so I think no matter, you know, that's translation or if you want to be a painter or you want to be a singer or you want to be a writer of any kind, mm. I think that's, that's the thing I would say to somebody. All right because art does have a huge effect on society and culture, as we've mentioned today. Uh, so let's talk about what's next for you. I hear that you have uh, a very busy schedule coming up uh, relating around the Korean poetry books that you're yeah. working on right now. Tell us about some of those activities. Uh, I'm translating, I mean, I've got multiple projects going on right now. I'm translating another play by Kim kyung Ju. Mm -hmm. We're probably gonna go together in December because I'll be liaising uh, for him. <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll, we'll probably go to New York in December when his, when his plays will be produced there. Um, I'm doing a book with Ji Yoon Lee, who's another tra fantastic translator, Don Mi Choi and Johannes Gornson, of three contemporary female poets, Kim Yi Dum, Kim Min Jung, and Kim Hang Suk. Mm -hmm. And that's coming out in Australia in January with Vagabond Press. And then I'm translating also Kimmy Dum's Hysteria, which should come out sometime next year in America, mm -hmm. and maybe another place. And then like various other projects here and there of younger writers. So very busy few months ahead. Yeah. <laughs> what about the wider future? Do you have an ultimate goal or dream in life? If in the future, you know, my students become great translators and have their work published, mm. even more than my own accomplishments, if my students continue their interest in literature and pursue that course in their life and have some success, mm. I think that will mean a lot to me. Okay. I'll feel like I've really done something. Right. So Jake Levine, poet, translator, teacher, liaison. You have so many roles in life and I hope you're hugely successful in all of those. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. You've definitely sparked my interest in Korean poetry. Um, and I'm so glad that you're doing your part to extend the reach of Korean poetry in the world. So thank you so much and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.